Let's pray. Lord, you give us your word. Lord, I pray that we are open today to receive that, that we would open our ears, that we would open our hearts, and that we would let that word sink down and be rooted in each of us so that we can bear that abundant fruit. In your name we pray. Amen. It was in March of this year that the residents in South Jordan, Utah, woke up to a surprise. As they looked out their windows, they saw thousands and thousands of tumbleweeds. Yes, you heard me right. Tumbleweeds. That scraggly weed which typically shows up as a supporting cast in Western movies. All of these weeds were strewn all around town. And, and there was video footage of this event that went viral. Like there were, there were vehicles that were completely buried. There were homes which had tumbleweeds up to the second story. There were streets that were completely impassable until the city got their trucks out and literally, yes, literally plowed the streets so that people could get through. It was dubbed a tumbleweed takeover, or tumblemageddon. And you know, we, we kind of chuckle, we laugh about that, and yet here's the serious side of this. I, I look at the world that we live in, and I believe that we're living increasingly in a tumbleweed takeover. I mean, listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4. He speaks of people who are blown here and there by the wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Like This is the world that we live in. There are all these voices that are vying for our attention and they're blowing us in this direction and that. There are voices on social media. There are voices in the entertainment industry. There are voices in the political sector. And yes, there are even competing voices in the church and theological circles. And much of it is deceptive and hollow. And it threatens to throw us and blow us off course. And it makes it difficult, just like it was for the residents of South Jordan, it makes it difficult for us to navigate life. And so what's our response? As Christians, as the church, what is our response? I believe our response is simply to remain rooted. And that's what Psalm 1 says leads us toward today. So if you've got a Bible with you, you want to grab one of the pew Bibles in front of you, we're going to be in the book of Psalms, smack dab in the middle of your Bibles. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 1. In your pew Bible, that's page 431. And as we look at these words, we're going to see that the writer's going to make this comparison and contrast between two different types of people. You're going to see people who are tumbleweeds, and you're going to see people who are trees. You're going to see people who are blown here and there, and you're going to see people who refuse to judge. And really, as, as we look at this entire psalm, it's, it's about the environment that we put ourselves in. Like, who are we choosing to listen to? What voices are we allowing to influence us? Who are we taking our cues from? And the decisions that we make about the environment that we put ourselves in can either stifle our growth or it can stimulate our growth. So, what does he say? Verse 1, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. Now, there's an intentional progression here. It's not just that he's poetically rephrasing things. There's actually a couple of things that are going on. First of all, he's talking about this increased level of proximity. So it's one thing to kind of be walking along and seeing something happen. It's another to stop and stand there. And it's another to sit down and to participate in it. So there's an increasing level of proximity. But then there's also escalating degrees of sin. Is it a one-time sin? Is it somebody who makes a habit of sin? Or is it somebody who is outright, blatantly disregarding anything that has to do with God, making a mockery of it? So how are we living our lives? 
How much are we allowing the voices of culture around us to influence us? And what type of voices are we allowing to influence us? I think one of the easiest places to just look at this through is through the lens of screen time. Like increasingly, we live in a culture where we are exposed almost constantly to a screen. The average American is over seven hours and four minutes of screen time. Now, wherever you fall in that, I just want you to take a moment of reflection this morning as you look at your screen usage in your life. Ask yourself, okay, how much time are you spending on social media? And what voices are you allowing to influence you there? What are they saying? How much time are you spending watching the news? And what content there are you consuming? Or how much time are you spending watching Netflix? And what content are you consuming? Or what, what are you listening to on Pandora or some other platform? How much time are you spending there? And what content are you consuming? How much time are you spending surfing the internet? And what content are you consuming? You know, with all of these things, it's so easy to get caught up in the tumbleweed takeover where the winds of all of these teachings can lead us astray. And what's the end result of that? Look a little bit later in the psalm. Verses 4 and 5 says this, they, that is the wicked, or those who associate with them, are like chaff. We might say they're like tumbleweeds that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. You know those tumbleweeds that I talked about earlier in South Jordan, Utah? Guess what happened to them? Eventually they were gathered up, they were taken outside of the city, and they were burned. And in our gospel reading today from John chapter 15, this is what Jesus says is going to happen. Those who fail to remain connected, rooted in him, those who fail to have that relationship with him, ultimately, he says in verse 6, are gathered together and they're burned. And I don't know about you, but that's not where I want to end up. And thankfully, you and I don't have to because there's another way forward. Rather than being tumbleweeds, God invites us to be trees. And I love this imagery of Psalm 1. If you look at verses 2 and 3, it says, Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person, here's the imagery, that person is like a tree planted, rooted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prospers. Just picture that scene for a moment. Like th this tree that is planted, that is rooted by streams of water. You know, there, there's a, a famous tree down in Geneva County, Alabama. It's actually way down at the southern tip of the state, right there by the Florida Panhandle. And this tree, it's a, it's a massive oak that is situated at the convergence of two different rivers. And when I say massive, like it has branches that reach 100 feet into the sky. And if you're going to try and reach around the trunk, it takes six grown men to stretch around the trunk of this tree. It is believed to be one of the biggest and the oldest in the state. I mean, it is so old that it's affectionately known as the Constitution Oak. It's somewhere between 200 and 300 years old, going all the way back to the constitution of our country. And you ask yourself, how does a tree remain there as long as it does? The answer is by being rooted. By taking those roots and stretching them down deep into the refreshing waters that are around it. See, here, here's the fascinating thing about trees, and I don't know if you know this or not, but there's two parts of the tree. Like there's the part of the tree that we can see, there's the branches, but then there's the part that we can't see. There's the root system. And as much as you can see above the ground, it's actually also present below the ground, which means this, 
which means that the fruits in your life are directly related to the roots in your life. The fruits are correlated with the roots. What other people can see, who you are, the way that you live your life is a direct reflection of all of that work that you do behind the scenes of being rooted. So how do we become rooted? Well, what does Psalm chapter 1 say? It says, blessed is the one who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. How are we rooted? By meditating. Meditating on God's word. And, and, and this is a fascinating word. In the Hebrew language, it's a word that means to mutter something under your breath. See, for the ancient Jewish person, when they read Scripture, they didn't read it the same way that we do. Oftentimes, if we open our Bible, we're just scanning the words with our eyes. But to the ancient Jewish person, as they would read the words, they would mutter them under their breath. They would meditate on it. Have you ever watched somebody like reading out loud or overheard them reading out loud? Like, this is the way that kids actually learn to read, right? Like they're, they're, they're seeing it with their eyes, and then they're sounding it out with their lips, and you can hear them. And this is the way that God intended us to read his word, because it forces us to slow down. It forces us not only to see it, it forces us to hear it. As we mumble it, mutter it with our mouths, we can actually hear it with our ears, And we slow down to think about it and even to slow down enough to maybe begin to put some of it to memory. That's what the psalmist is talking about. Blessed is the one who meditates on the law, on the word of the Lord. And then he talks about frequency. He says, this is something that you do day and night. And here, now we're beginning to talk about the routines that we establish in our lives. Because you and I are rooted through our routines. Some of you, you are creatures of habit. Whether you know it or not, there are certain things that you do at certain times during the day. So you get up, and some of you, the very first thing that you do is you grab your phone. And there's something that you do. There's something that you're checking there on your phone. Maybe you're checking social media. Or as you look at your evening routines, as you're getting ready for bed, there are certain routines that you establish. Maybe it's that you're always watching the 9 o'clock news and then you are getting yourself ready for bed. We have certain routines in our lives that root us. And the psalmist says, The routines that we ought to establish that root us more than anything else are routines around God's Word. God's Word should be the very first thing in our day and the very last thing in our day. It should be a word that we return to in our afternoon walk or words that come to mind as we find ourselves up in the middle of the night. It should be words that guide the conversations that we have around the table or the reflections that we have as we're driving to and from work. It's words that should inform our prayers and the everyday conversations that we have. This is who we are called to be in a world where where we can be led astray by the winds of deceitful doctrines. We are called to remain rooted in God's word. And this is why, as a part of the strategic plan that we recently rolled out as a congregation, one of the things that we talk about is a strategy called triple-tier discipleship. Now, when I hear the word triple-tier, my mind as a foodie goes to triple-tier brownies. I don't know if you've ever had a triple-tier brownie, but it is ooey-gooey goodness, layer upon layer upon layer. So you've got the brownie on the bottom, and then you've got the cream cheese frosting layer in the middle, and then there's the Rice Krispies and chocolate layer on the top. And like, oh, this is so good. One is good, but three, three is so much better. And that's what we believe when it comes to being rooted in God's word, that there are intentional routines that we are to be rooted in. So I want to read for you for a moment from the the statement that we put together for our strategic plan. It says this, St. John's desires to see every person everywhere in an everyday relationship with Jesus. And how does that happen? Like, how do we get there? Through triple-tier discipleship. 
where through intentional conversation, understand this to be through routines that we create and establish in our lives with other believers on three different levels, in personal and family devotion, in small group study, and in weekend worship, the truths of God's word touch their hearts and transform their lives. It's three layers. I'm just going to take them in reverse. First layer is right here, right now, where you are. Weekend worship. Where you are gathered together with other believers. And I just want to speak for a moment about the value of corporate worship. Because it's so easy just to tune in online. And there might be a time and a place to do that. But if you find yourself in your life making an excuse to say, you know, I'm just going to stay at home and I'm just going to watch online. You're missing out. Because it is so easy to become distracted when you're simply watching something on a screen. When you actually show up in person, you're more fully present. So it's weekend worship where you're gathered together with others. That's the first tier. Then the second tier is small group study. And this might be a study on a Sunday morning or it might be a study during the week. It might be a study that uh, is already currently being done here at church. Or you're like, no, it's a new study that I want to start. And you're getting together with a group of other believers where you can talk this out. Where you can read it and you can begin to think about, okay, how do we respond to this? How do we live in light of this? And then there's the third tier. And I actually think this is the most important one. And this is that personal home life routine that you put in place around God's word. And here, there's research that's actually been done on this, talking about the power of four effect. So uh, a few years ago, there was uh, the Center for Bible Engagement that did a a research project on 40,000 Americans, and they asked them about their engagement, their daily habits around God's word. And what they discovered is that people who read their Bibles at least four different days or times during the week experience exponential change in their lives. So, for example, it affected their mental health. They were 30% less likely to be lonely, and they were 32% less likely to have anger issues. It affected them relationally, as they were 40% more likely to say that they were happily married. And it affected their behavior. They were 59% less likely to view pornography, 57% less likely to get drunk. And it affected them spiritually, as they were 60% less likely to say that they felt spiritually stagnant in their relationship with God. Hmm. Kind of sounds like the words of Psalm 1, doesn't it? Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on that law, he meditates day and night. He makes it a part of his regular rhythm and routine. He's like a tree that's planted, that's rooted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in due season. Everything he does prospers. And we live in a world where there's an increasing tumbleweed takeover, where we can be blown here and there by the winds of deceptive teaching. May we instead be a church that remains rooted in God's word. And may his spirit bring forth in us much fruit. Amen.